Welcome to the What's the Revolution show, a show for men and people who love them, where we discuss how men can find and embrace the revolution within themselves, where people can find and embrace the revolution within themselves. I am your host, Dr. Charles Corpru. What's good, revolutionaries? You've heard me talk at length about my beloved Camelback Ventures and the wonderful team there led by uh, Aaron Walker and my good friend, Riaz Gayasuddin. What a wonderful time that I had there for four years thinking about how we could actually invest not only monetarily and financially into founders of, who were women and people of color, but how we could provide a mentorship and support to people who are building amazing ventures who are actually building and creating ventures that are making sizable impact in our world. Think about that. What does it mean to have have and to create sizable impact in people's world? But one of the things I want to pull back for one second is that, you know, we were inside of a startup. Uh, I got there in year four, year five, as we thought about what it looked like as an organization to build and to grow. And one of the things that a company has to think about, large or small, is is how is it growing its leaders? Because the way that you're growing your leaders is, is the way that you're growing your company culture. And I want to thank Aaron and Riaz and the team for really diligently thinking about me and, and intentionally thinking about what it meant for leaders to lead the organization. And it was interesting because I kept hearing about this term. And then all of a sudden we started to practice this. It was this term of conscious leadership. I was like, what is this? What is this? And we began to read what seemingly is the Bible around conscious leadership, what is called the 15 commitments to conscious leadership. I became so immersed in, in this book and its practices. And as a culture of an organization, we began to look at how we could actually illuminate ourselves and our organization around practices that would actually make us more self-aware about ourselves. And then as an organization, and then there was this radical shift one day because the first tenet in itself was taking a hundred percent responsibility. I'm like, wait, what's that? A hundred percent responsibility. Like I'm responsible for the outcomes of my life. But if you think about that, if an organization and a culture comes together and everybody takes a hundred percent responsibility for the outcome, whatever it is, then people are thinking about not blaming but saying, how can I actually step up? How can I take responsibility for the greatness of the organization? And actually, how can I take responsibility, my individual responsibility for when things go wrong? And that is a wonderful thing. And I began thinking about how do you revolutionaries take a conscious leadership approach to your life? And so I began doing my homework and all of a sudden I came across this luminary. Uh, and I wanna say this, this luminary, Joyce Chen. And when, if you do a Google search on Joyce, and actually just go to her LinkedIn page, you will find out that Joyce has done so much, so much in her life, but has been transformed really. If you, if you listen to her talk today, transformed by conscious leadership. I just want to introduce, like I said, I, and I told her in the green room, I very rarely get nervous when talking to people, but Joyce is a luminary. She is an award-winning filmmaker the former head of uh, production at Meta, you all know Meta, uh, formerly Facebook, and now is an acclaimed leadership work coach working for the Conscious Leadership Group. And so I'm excited. I'm super excited to welcome Joyce Chen to the What's Your Revolution show. Joyce, I'm excited. Like I said, how are you? I'm really good. I'm really excited to be here. I feel a lot of joy um, <laughs> and I'm feeling really alive. It, at this point in my life, I feel like I'm doing everything I want to be doing at the pace I want to be doing it. Mm. That is a beautiful thing. I, I, I love that. I, I love hearing that. What does that mean? I, I want to unpack that. What does it mean at the, at the pace of your life? You're doing everything you want to do and at the pace of your life. Because I think when people hear that, what does that mean? Uh, you're taking a break. Are you resting? How does that play out? Oh, yeah, that's such a great question. I think that for a lot of my life, I was somebody who was incredibly driven, really ambitious. I had parents who um, pushed me really hard and I started to join the workforce in a way where there was a constant sense of urgency. Mm. Um, 
So first I was working in film and commercial production and everything was like, get it turned around, move things as quickly as possible. And then I became an executive at Meta. And again, mm -hmm. there's um, these timelines for everything. Everybody's running towards goals. And I got swept up in the mm -hmm. pace of uh, the world that was telling me what I should do, um, what success should look like, um, what, uh, what fulfillment in, the, in my career should be according to other people's standards or what society right. or my culture was telling me. And so I jumped on that treadmill and I ran as fast as I could without mm. really pausing to think, do I have a whole body yes to everything that I'm doing at the speed that I'm doing it? And is it fulfilling? Do I feel congruent to my purpose? Um, so the last five or six years of my life, I've really been dedicated to pausing and taking a hard look at at the way that I spend my time mm. um, and starting to find my own internal pace where I'm doing what I want to be doing. I'm feeling as alive as possible. So living in my full aliveness um, and then having a, a breath and spaciousness and enoughness in mm. my experience of how I'm doing all of that. Mm. Joyce, thank you so much. You know, so much that I hear, I have these conversations with my wonderful mother who is 82 years old and she kind of illuminates a larger conversation that I think many Americans are having is that people don't want to work. Um, you know, we, 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 we hear this narrative, uh, particularly as the pandemic has moved on. Um, but people are not, you know, going back. I see so many signs for people who help wanted. And I get into this debate with, with folks, you know, people, people don't want to work. They don't want to work. And I, I don't, I don't think that's the narrative. I don't think that's actually the correct narrative. I think people have reevaluated what work looks like and what you're saying, um, like the pace of life. And I think uh, many of our younger coaches have, have realized that it's it's not this work ex extremely hard, find big titles until you're 65 years old, retire, and then hopefully you get 20, 25 years where you can slow down and relax and enjoy. Many people, as you said, you know, are really thinking about what does the pace of life look like? What does rest look like? Because we talk about this so much on the show. Rest is revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And so much so, and, and it, 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 you know, back when I was coming up, like it was, all you know, work hard, work hard, grind, grind, grind. And grinding will turn you into dust. And I know working at Meta are very, you know, a high achievement, high goal oriented. You've got to meet your metrics, all of these different things. You're working 12, 15, 18 hours a day. What kind of life is, what kind of life is that? You know, when you've realized that, and like you said, this whole body, yes, this fullness, this pace of life is a wonderful thing. And I, I wonder how many people, whether you're you know, whether you're working at Kroger, which is the local grocery store here, or you're working at Meta or somewhere, the realization is that I want to, I want a revolution in how I live. And that's what that look, that's what that looks like. So thank you for, you know, really illuminating that. And there are a lot of different topics that we're going to discuss that you just talked about, but I really want to define, I really want to define uh, and really move into it because a lot of things you just said are around this conscious leadership, being conscious of who I am as an individual. And then being conscious of who I am as a leader. So let's let let's just start about defining our terms. What is conscious leadership? Yeah. So we define conscious leadership at the Conscious Leadership Group um, in two parts. We define conscious as being in the here and now in a non-triggered, non-reactive state. Mm. Now that's a really important definition because so many of us and so many of the clients that I work with don't realize how much of the time we are operating in a triggered reactive state. Mm. And then we define leadership as people who are willing to take responsibility for their impact and their influence in the world and over others. You know, as I, as I sit here and think Joyce and, and, and thank you for that very succinct definition, what stands out to me really is a triggered state, like not being in a triggered state, you know, being in a, you know, and, and you know, I, I debate with some of my friends around like triggered or I, I'm triggered. And, you know, uh, some people will say, you know, your people are over triggered. They actually, they don't, they may not know what their triggers are, or um, they have illuminated too many triggers. I don't agree with this as a psychologist, people understand, people understand how their 
physiological responses are to certain things. There's, you know, we've, we've talked at length on this show about trauma and childhood trauma and how that plays out as an adult in certain situations. But to recognize what a trigger is and then hopefully figure out how to be in spaces and with, pe with people and in organizations that you're not triggered, where you can bring the fullness of yourself. And excuse me, define leadership as a part of that again, just one more time. It's those who are willing to take responsibility right. for their impact, impact and influence over others. And another definition we use that I love is those who are willing to step into the unknown. Mm. Now, when we're in a triggered state um, and conscious leadership, in conscious leadership, we talk about this all the time. Um, we're in a constricted state of resistance um, where we're perceiving threat happening to us. Mm. And so it becomes, in my experience, much more difficult to step into the unknown when you are in that state of constriction, uh, resistance and threat. Yes. Which kind of leads me to the basic framework that we use inside of conscious leadership, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. And that's yes. the idea that at any given point, we are reacting to life from, from, we use a model that's just a line. We draw a line. It's a binary model. We react to the world, circumstances, people, um, everything that's out there from above the line, which is being in a state of trust, curiosity, seeing life as a game of learning. Or we respond to it from below the line. And that's being in a state of resistance, threat, constriction, um, as I just talked about a second ago. Um, and it's human nature to go below the line because right. as humans, our egos are hardwired yeah. to put through threat. So back in the caveman days, um, we, if we perceive threat to our security, control, or approval of those around us, that could actually me mean danger to our survival. Yes. It could be, it could risk whether or not we would live or die. But in today's world, our brains or our egos have a hard time um, distinguishing the difference between if our survival is actually a threat or if it's just an everyday email that pops into your inbox, a text that you get, um, that is just your ego perceiving a threat to security control or approval. So what I want to say is being triggered is not bad. It's just being human. It happens it's just all being the human. time. And you know, it, there's another way to operate that could create a different experience of life and could create radically different outcomes if we're willing to locate ourselves in that triggered state and see what it might look like to experience that same exact person, situation, or thing from above the line. Mm -hmm. And I think, and actually, I'm, I'm more so that I know being above the line is actually coming with an with an air or aura of curiosity. Like yeah. curiosity about yourself. Why am I triggered? You know, why is this triggering? You know, and we'll talk about this in a few moments. What are the stories that I'm actually telling myself around this? You know, is this? And so, as you said, the brain, the brain is hardwired to, you know, uh, move towards negativity because negativity actually was a survival technique. This is a threat. Let me perceive this as a threat first. And then discern whether or not it's the threat, because if, if I am ready to go, if my flatter responses are ready to go, I actually can save my life. But we live in a world now with, you know, where there, you know, we can recognize our, our, our brains have formed. We just have to be conscious, right? We have to be really conscious. Let me come with this with curiosity. What did Joyce mean in this email, right? What did Joyce or, or, Yes. What did Joyce mean? And what, and by coming with curiosity, it means that I'm actually going to call Joyce and ask, Hey, um, I just, you know, I just want to understand what you mean by some of the, what your email is saying, instead of drawing this, you know, this conclusion that uh, Joyce is this way and, you know, email and text have a wonderful way of conveying all of the emotions that people think, uh, are accurate when they aren't. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I, I think there are actually a few really practical tools that we can use when we notice we're in that state. So um, first, like one of the things that we say in conscious leadership is that we cannot change or we cannot shift that which we're not aware of. Mm. So the most important thing is, can you locate yourself? Do you know if you're triggered? And are you willing to just notice and say, oh, there's a there's a trigger happening here, a constriction? And then are you willing to pause? And it could be for a couple minutes, it could be for a couple breaths, but
but a conscious pause where you notice and you pause in the reactivity or the trigger. And then you start you start to notice because what underlies any time we're below the line is fear. Yes. Are you willing to accept yourself for being just getting scared because you're a human being? Mm -hmm. So can I accept myself for just being a little triggered and scared in this moment? And then from that place where your nervous system has calmed down because you can just notice, Oh, I'm, I just got a little scared and that's okay. From that place, you can start to get curious and start to interrogate your reactivity. Right. Right. I think about this, you know, um, as a, you know, I, I don't want to call myself a former masculinity researcher. I mean, you know, once a PhD, always a researcher, always thinking about, you know, what your dissertation is on and how you have then proliferated this uh, out into the world. But I think about the men that listen to my show and, you know, the masculinity that comes in and the strategies, the masculine strategies that come in, I'm triggered. Right. And even admitting that sounds like, wait a minute, I'm not going to admit that I'm triggered. Right. I'm not going to admit that I'm scared. And typically, and I'll say this, typically men are the strategies that men use is that we're going to not admit to fear. Uh, we're going to not admit that we're triggered, but we're going to do, I'll say nefarious things or, or deleterious things that might harm us mm -hmm. or the ones that are around it and particularly in, in leadership. Mm -hmm. And I, I think about leaders who are higher up CEOs, uh, C-suite individuals, people who are leading larger teams. I think there's this expectation and even for women who, who are in this space who have to deal with the, the uh, potential stereotypes of being a woman in leadership is that not showing that you're triggered, mm -hmm. not showing that you're fearful. And I was reading an article. I want to say I was reading the uh, article the other day as I was doing some research, maybe it was from you, but it was talking about how a CEO I think maybe it's the book that I'm reading. A CEO was talking about how he was afraid, but he was afraid to tell his um, employees that he was triggered or that, that he was fearful about something. And it was a coach. It was actually his coach that said, maybe you should tell your employees. Yeah. And he was like, but I'm the person who's supposed to be leading the ship. I'm supposed to, supposed to be the person that they come to. Yeah. But you're human. Right. I love that and you're what, waking up. Yeah. I, I, mean, I would, I would jump in to say when we deny that we're triggered, when we deny that we feel fear, we're done, we're denying ourselves of our humanity. So at, at a very basic human level, we're denying that we're just human beings having an experience in relationship with others. And, right. and the, at, from a business level, we're denying ourselves the ability to relate and connect with other people at the heart level, at the human level. Um, we're also denying ourselves a kind of intelligence mm -hmm. because inside of fear, there is a lot of intelligence. So and inside of being triggered, there's intelligence. So your ego is perceiving threat. You, you, you get triggered, you drop below the line and you're getting scared. There's actually fear from above the line. It's not necessarily a negative thing. Fear tells us to, to be present to pay attention that something mm -hmm. wants to be learned. And so leaders who don't have access to fear are really dangerous for their organizations and their team mm. because they can't sense fear when it's around the corner or, or when it's, when something could be endangering the group or the organization. Right. Um, and one of the things that I love that the author Arthur Brooks talks about is this idea that um, we don't want fearless leaders. We want courageous leaders because yes. leaders who can't harness the intelligence of their fear are dangerous, but leaders who are willing to feel fear and move forward anyways, by harnessing that intelligence are the ones who are, who have courage. Right. It's wonderful to think about this, Joyce, because you dropped in such a pearl is that when we actually analyze fear, there's an opportunity to learn, why am I fearful? And what can I do potentially to overcome this fear, potentially as a leader, as I'm leading organizations? And we'll talk about why conscious leadership is so important, actually, in personal relationships. Um, but thinking about that, you know, am I fearful that we're not going to make payroll? Well, what are the opportunities or strategies that I can use? Uh, there's an opportunity for this. Or I want to I, I'm fearful that we're going to scale too fast. Well, what's the strategies or what are the thoughts or what do I need to do as a leader to ensure that it's not my fear that's hindering us or holding us back? And we'll talk, you know, there's so much because 
we're going to get into your journey. And I think it's important that we, we weave conscious leadership into what you're doing in your life right now. But I want to talk about a couple more terms, just, you know, just so my listeners, my revolutionaries can understand when we think about conscious leadership, there are a couple more things I want to, I, I want to unpack, uh, in the 15 commitments. One of the things number 10 talks about exploring opposite views. We live in a, we live in a world right now. Think about that where we are trying to harness the power of diversity and diversity of thought. But oftentimes it's hard because it's hard for some, I'll say that it's hard for some because they may or may not be looking for opposite views. Um, and I can't think about this, the psychological term that we use. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's when we are so, you know, destined to say, this is the right point of view, or this is the point of view that I know is right. And we haven't looked for any opposing views, but for us, I, I want you to talk a little bit about that. Why that's important in conscious leadership to really look for opposite views. I always, I often call it, what's the red team view that I, that I need to see. Um, and oftentimes when we were doing due diligence at Camelback Ventures, I was the red team person. I, I would be like, ah, everybody's, everybody's really happy about this venture. Why shouldn't we be? So talk about that for a second for me. Yeah. At the Conscious Leadership Group, we believe that all drama in life is caused by needing to be right. Mm. <laughs> so just noticing how righteously you're holding on to your beliefs and your stories um, and how much suffering or how much drama that's creating for you in your life. And we use the practice of holding opposites or looking at the opposite of our stories as a way of taking that grip on our righteousness and just starting to loosen it, mm. loosen the grip of that suffering or that anxiety or that drama that comes with needing to be right. Why do you think Joyce that it is for some, and I'll say this uh, again for some that the need to be right is so permanent. There's a permanence in being right. Is it the ego? Is it that the ego is so strong that, you know, I, I need to be right, that my ego, I, I can't, I need validation or my ego needs validation for being right. And so I won't, I can hold on to this permanence. What do you think it is that some people and particularly people in leadership say, I've got to be right. And I will hold on to this, even though the opposing views may lead them in a different direction. Is it the fear that we just talked about? Yeah, I think there's a kind of, our egos are, Again, it's like we're almost hardwired to need to be right, to, uh, to feel safe and secure in our minds. Mm -hmm. And so we see this a lot in highly political or hierarchical organizations where everybody is holding on to their need to be right as a, as a form of feeling safe. But then when you multiply that by 100 leaders, you have a tension that feels unresolvable or um, people who are unwilling to collaborate or uh, bring diverse perspectives to the table and create win for alls. Um, so part of, I think I had a thought that I wanted to share about needing to be right, which is, um, Oh, I just lost it. Don't worry about it. Um, Oh man, I just lost it. I was gonna. <laughs> many, many of us, you know, are, are looking for, I, I, I know that my, you know, my, one of my childhood best friends, we get into some very terse arguments. Um, and I, they are arguments. They are, well, I won't say that. They're very terse debates because I think arguments are, um, can be harmful to mm -hmm. a relationship. So we get into very, very tense, terse, terse debates about various things, but we can come back together. And I had lunch with him, uh, last week. Um, and we had probably sometime in the fall, we had had a, just a very, very intense mm -hmm. debate about, women and strength and relationships. And we were both, we were very much so on opposing views about this. Mm -hmm. um, and we ended up hanging up the phone on each other. But the one thing, you know, and now we're at lunch, we're probably two or three months later. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to him, I said, I know that we have terse conversations sometimes, but what I love is that I go back sometimes and I will review our conversation and I will internalize that. And I will see where, where am I fitting into this conversation and where, where am I wrong or where can I learn from this conversation? Yes. I love yes. that. I love that you're speaking to that because, and I just remembered what I was going to say, um, this, 
being right doesn't, one of the like big wake up moments for me inside of learning conscious leadership was this idea that being right doesn't require a lot of energy. It doesn't require a lot of defensive energy. Yes. So if you have to chase being right, if you have to fight to, to prove your point of view or prove that you're right, there's a high likelihood that there is no right or wrong answer. So if you, if you say two plus two equals four, that doesn't require a lot of energy to put in the way. But if you're arguing with your manager about whether or not the performance system is fair or, you know, how you should be leading a certain kind of project and it's consume, it's energy expensive, it's consuming a lot of energy for you to prove that you're right about your point of view, then that just lets you know it's a little warning flag that maybe there is no right or wrong answer mm, here. Right. It's taking that much energy and that it could create a win for all if you were to invite opposing points of view or to start to hold opposites or, or look at the opposites of your story. Right. Right. It is. And you, again, I, I love because it does take work. It's easy to walk away from those conversations. It'd been very easy for Quince and I to walk away from this conversation and be like, I'm right. I'm right. And you know, that's it. But the wonderful thing, as you said, was the hard work that both of us had to do to come back and say, you know what? I took pieces of what you were saying and I wove them into what I was saying. And, and actually it, it gave me a greater insight that there are, there are contexts in which, you know, both of our arguments are valid. There are contexts in which both of our arguments are invalid. And I think that in an organization and even relationships where right, we think about that because, you know, whether they're romantic relationships or family relationships, we're going to disagree but how do we take a conscious perspective and say, where, where does this, where does this ideology or theory or paradigm come from? How do my experiences, right? And learning all of those things play into what I'm saying. And then how does the learning from that other person play into this? And what can I learn from all of this? And that's the hard work. I think, you know, the, the, the hard work around conscious leadership, and it, it is hard work. I will say that to be a conscious leader to show up every day for yourself and for the people, your family, for your organization, it takes hard work. It is the reality that in those conversations, in that self-awareness, you're going to have to think about someone else. You have to take the hundred percent responsibility to say, I'm not only going to think about myself, I'm going to think about the other person or the other people in this organization. I think that's what makes organizations and leaders great. But doing that hard work, knowing that it is energy intensive mm -hmm. to actually be a conscious leader. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, I think because the human experience is to every time we perceive threat to get triggered, drop below the line, um, just by being human reactivity is happening all the time. So when, when I hear you say energy intensive, it's this discipline of constantly noticing, did I just get reactive? Did I just get triggered? Where am I? Um, and knowing that you can create a totally different experience of life from above the line and below the line. You could throw, I always say this to my clients, you could throw a birthday party from above the line and feel this like deep internal sense of well-being, joy, happiness. And you could throw a birthday party from below the line and feel angry. You could leave in tears, frustrated, and like you never want to do it again. So could you, li could, could you li live your entire life from below the line and be fine? Probably. And I think yeah. there are probably a lot of really successful a lot of people who, who are operating from that place, but there's a different experience that they're having of life from being in that constricted state. There's a different experience others are having of them. You know, we've all experienced or worked with people who are below the line and they don't know it. And <laughs> there's a cap on the outcome that they're delivering. Because what we know is from below the line, there's a much lower probability of the best possible outcome. And that's because when we're triggered and below the line, we uh, have limited access to the problem solving mm. part of our brain. Yes. Yes. And so it's almost like if somebody put a big project pro or problem in front of you and asked you to solve it, but your house is on fire with your family in it behind you. You can't do it. You're not fully present and you're, you're, you don't have access to all three centers of intelligence, your IQ, your EQ, your emotional intelligence, your BQ, your body intelligence, um, because when it's constricted, you just have less access to all of that intelligence. Right. So imagine right. And, a world in which 
you could shift to above the line and solve that same problem, how much more available and how much more intelligence is behind that solution. Mm. That's, that's the beautiful moment right there. And like you said earlier, the practice of stopping, pausing, recognizing I'm triggered, or as we say at a camelback, I'm below the line. We actually would actually acknowledge that to say, I'm, a, I'm below the line, yeah. you know? And like you said, there are times that there are a lot of times that we're going to be below the line. There's that acknowledgement, that conscious acknowledgement that I'm below the line. What are the practices that I need to do now to get above the line? Mm -hmm. Right. Stop, pause, come with curiosity. Uh, I think that's, that, that, that's the big come with curiosity. And also what is, what is my responsibility and thinking about how I got to be triggered or, and below the line mm -hmm. moving through those states. Um, it always flies by the time, time always flies by. And I want to spend some time really, really talking about you and your journey and then weaving some more of conscious, the conscious leadership principles, you know, revolutionaries, if you go and you Google Joyce Chen, I want you to go to her LinkedIn page because she has a wonderful nine part blog that talked about her revolution, as, as we say here. Um, like I said, at the outset of the show, she is a luminary. She's done so many things in the world. But at some point, she realized that, you know, she wanted to find time and her own pace. And that is a wonderful thing. Joyce, talk about it. You said, you know, what happened in your 40s is, is that you decided to give up what would think like this dream job as the head of production at Meta. I mean, a global conglomerate, one of the largest companies in the world that has tremendous influence on how people interact with each other. We think, I think about early Facebook, you know, when I was at Tulane in 2005, where, was, you know, it was just for college students and interacting and posting pictures. Now it is a global juggernaut of information where people can connect in a variety of ways. The podcast is advertised all over Facebook, different things. It is just, it, it has shifted how we interact. So, you know, you're the head of production there. This would seemingly seem like, Oh my, I've made it. I'm there. There's, you know, I'm golden. But in your forties, you decided to give that up, you know, so walk us through this and how did conscious leadership impact how you move through making this huge change in your life? Yeah. Um, thank you for asking this question. It's a big one. Um, and I love to share this story. So, Please. um, by the time I was head of production at Meta, I mean, it, it had been building. I had been working in the same industry, which is marketing and advertising for 20 years. Um, and while I had this job that people admired, or it was considered, a, I don't know, a big job, whatever that means, um, <laughs> that I had large scope, that I had a big team. And honestly, I had an amazing team and we were creating great work. I still didn't feel fully fulfilled um, something I would constantly say is that I want more work-life balance, which is a, a flag in myself. And when I hear it in others, um, because I would say that, but then what I was doing was working 80 hour weeks and I was creating that for myself. I was pushing myself really hard. Um, I was not in peak fitness or diet. I was, uh, I had broken relationships. I was coming out of a divorce at that time. Um, and I just, it on, on, in my resume, it looked like I had everything put together that success was, should, should be in front of me. Happiness should be in front of me. And I didn't feel that way. I didn't feel fulfilled or congruent to my purpose. And one of the things that woke me up to that was realizing through conscious leadership was noticing how often I was triggered and below the line around my career, how much I was blaming other people, whether it was my manager, the company, the industry, COVID, at an unconscious level, how much I was blaming others for my unhappiness. How, how many, if only thoughts I was carrying around that were gating my own happiness and joy. Mm. If only I, if I could get this promotion, if only I could have this salary, if only this or that would happen, then I'd be happy. Waking up to how I was holding myself back from my, living in my full aliveness. And so as I was thinking of you over the last couple of days, you always ask the question, what's your revolution? Yes. And for me in my career journey, my revolution was unsubscribing to the toxic beliefs that I allowed to rule my life. 
but put a ceiling on my own fulfillment and my mm. own potential. And instead, reaching for my full aliveness, living in that full aliveness. I love you, and thank you for thank you thank you for answering the question in, in such a such a, a meaningful way, unsubscribing to the toxic thinking that we've had. And 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 it's interesting that you you know you describe what some people would think as like the fulfillment, like I, I fulfilled my goals. But for some, this this is a toxic way of being, working eighty hours a week, and thinking that you know having the the title. All of these huge titles uh, mean, mean something, but it also means, like you said, many people are clamoring. We talked about this in the green room is that what does the pace of life look like where I can be fulfilled? I can enjoy my family. I can eat well. I can take care of my body. Yes, we all want to be paid well. And I think there's this thought, this older thought that you have to work, you know, extremely hard for extremely long to be paid very, very well. But what we've seen is that knowledge and wisdom and talent, right? We, we have to rethink what that looks like for us. And that's what you've done. That's what you've done. And one of the things I want, I want to pull out a couple of things that really stood out to me. And thank you for the wonderful story because it, it, it makes me think about my own journey. And, you know, I, I left Camelback June 30th. I worked for this wonderful organization with a wonderful group of people who I love. Like I, I love the work and it taught me so much. But I also realized that it, it was taking time away from like the most important thing for me at the time was my father. My father was, I didn't know it at the time, but my father was dying. Um, he got sick late June and I realized it was like, I don't know when I'm going to get this time back. And I, I didn't, right? I got two and a half months from July, from July 1st to September 16th. And I wouldn't change it in the world because I said, I'm going to move out of this place that I love with people that I love and a, a mission and a vision that I love. I'm going to focus on my family. I'm going to focus on this podcast. Like, so I love that you said unsubscribe to what the, the tenants that have been actually socialized in us for so long. Like you've got to work hard. You've got to do all of these different things. You've got to be Dr. Corporate. You've got to be director or executive director of all these different things. One of the things that stood out in your blog that I loved and it made me really think is that what is our most exquisite life? That is such a beautiful thing to me. And it really made me think like, what does that look like? Talk about that for me. Right? And the paradigm as you know, as we look, what is our most exquisite life? Not a good life, not a great life, exquisite. Because when I think of exquisite, I'm thinking like, Ooh, this just, like you said, at the outside of the show, it gives me a little tingles when I think about that. What is that for you? Yeah, the, the idea of the most exquisite life is something that I talked at length about with Diana Chapman, who's one of the founders of Conscious Leadership. Um, and she really encouraged me to be able to envision and to name what my most exquisite life looked like. And doing that sounds a lot more simple than, it's so much easier said than done because there's a lot of fear, I noticed, well, in myself when it came to na naming my most exquisite life. And that's because I had subscribed to a set of beliefs that were really limiting my ability to live in my full aliveness or um, a lit name or see that most exquisite life. And so some of the beliefs I was subscribing to was that moving up, whatever that corporate ladder looked like, that title, that whatever the salary looked like in my head, that moving up was gonna equal success or some level of fulfillment. Um, that more was better. If I had more scope, more, a bigger team, more money, more bonuses, that that would make me happy. And the third one was that as long as I was ambitious and I was getting it, going after it, that, that, that I was unstoppable and that I would be happy and keep getting more as a result of that. And so I had to notice how much I was doing that and that it created a world for my, I created a world for myself where to take hundred percent responsibility whereby subscribing to these beliefs, I was actually doing more what other people thought I should and paying very little attention to what I had a whole body yes to. Right. When we define whole body yes as when your IQ, your, your brain intelligence, your EQ, your heart, your emotional intelligence, and your BQ, your body intelligence, align in a check, check, check. It's a reverberating yes. And 
um, I had to find uh, where my whole body yes was, start to pay a lot of attention and be discerning about that. Um, and a lot of it had little, very little to do with these toxic beliefs that I was subscribing to that were driving my everyday behaviors, actions, 80 hour weeks that I was putting myself through. And so I had to let go of those toxic beliefs in order to really look inward and start to examine where is my whole body yes? What motivates me? Why do I work? What feels fulfilling? How am I being congruent with my greatest purpose? And then by doing that, I was able to start to imagine my most exquisite life and mm -hmm. then to be able to name it out loud and say, this is what I want. This is what I will st stand for. And I'm not going to compromise that. And, and for me, it was really, I mean, it was a simple life. It was getting to write one or two hours a day about the things that I cared about and to express you know, what's in here. Um, to be able to coach and help others and spread this work, help others to feel free, um, to be able to train teams and shift the cultures um, that I knew were could be harmful or detrimental to people's greatest growth or evolution, um, being able to spend time with the people that I love, right. to exercise, to eat well, um, and to name all of these things that I think, first, I didn't know were my most exquisite life, and then I was too scared to name them because I had what's called an upper limit where I didn't believe I even deserved all of those things. Who am I to have such a life is a question that would come up for me from below the line. And, and then scarcity mindset would, yes. would follow, which is okay. If I have that life, how will I support myself and my family? Yes. So having to challenge that and believe I am perfect, whole and complete, just the way I am. And if I stand in my, in my vision for my most exquisite life, if I stop outsourcing approval, if I believe that I'm the only person who can make, who can unsafe myself, I'm the only person who could um, make me feel any loss of security, that I'll always have enough. So I had to fall back into trusting that and believing if I put energy out in the world that it would come back to me in the form of enoughness. And I, right. same thing that Renee Brown talks about, which I like, is she doesn't say abundance. She says enoughness. Because for myself, I was overestimating how much I actually needed to be happy. <laughs> I, I, I listen and think about, like, my own journey. And, and thank you for illuminating that. Um, my friends will say a lot of times that I will put barriers in place to my joy, to my most exquisite life. And I am working through some of those blocks, whether it be a scarcity block or a, a financial, a, a money mindset block. Um, as I'm on this journey of, of my own revolution in, you know, this next iteration of who is Dr. Charles Corporal, who is Charles Corporal, or as my father would call me, Chucky, um, you know, who is that? And, you, you talk about this full body. Yes, because I'm taking a lot of conversations. Like I'm having a lot of coffee. Like people are like, mm -hmm. okay, you've left Camelback. Um, your father's past. You're taking time to grieve, but also what is the next thing that you're going to do? Because we've got something in mind for you. But what this makes me think about as, as I do the due diligence uh, about my own life and what I want to do, it, it is truly asking myself one, what does my most exquisite life look like? Um, and how do I want to spend my time with folks? Cause there's a lot of things that I could do or my revolutionaries could do, but finding that, as you said, finding that whole body. Yes. And really thinking, because I don't, I, I don't know how many people, and I know I hadn't thought about this whole body. Yes. And there's a decision that I have to make about seeing someone. And I was reading, as I was reading your blog, I was like, do I have a whole body yes with this? And I really had to discern. I was like, it really made me think about, do I really want to go? And if, you know, if there's not a whole body yes with this, maybe you shouldn't go. Because you, something is telling you. And then I also had to think, I was like, well, is there, a, am I blocking myself mm -hmm. from this as well? But there's, I think there's also an intentionality that my body would say, this is a whole body. Yes. You can go because three weeks ago, 
you know, it was a whole body yes when I met with this group of investors. And the trip to Atlanta was three times more than it usually is, but I decided to go mm -hmm. without any reservation and was like, okay, I'm going to pay three times what I usually pay to travel, you know, on a, a, a round trip airfare to Atlanta because I want to be in the room with these folks. I want to do this. I want to see how this plays out. And there's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I, I had to discern between both of those. Like, hmm, I'm a little reticent to go. Same mm -hmm. place, same time. And I, w I went without any hesitant. There was a full body yes. And so I think as we, you know, and, and part of that decision of me going is thinking about what is my most exquisite life mm -hmm. look like? You know, yeah. where's the financial as aspect of that? Go ahead. There, as I hear you talk about um, whole body yes and just that discernment process, um, mm -hmm. there are a couple pro tips because the whole body yes sounds uh, deceptively simple, but I think it can take a lifetime to really <laughs> get a hold on. And so some of the things that I've learned about the whole body yes are um, first is that it's really hard to access the whole body yes when you're below the line. So mm -hmm. that's why frameworks like above the line, below the line are so important as the foundational work. So you can locate yourself and just say, where am I? When you talk about creating your own barriers, am I below the line in a state of reactivity and then creating barriers? Um, and am I willing to shift? What does trust curiosity, looking at the op opposite of my stories, how does that create a shift in me? And then from there, seeing if you can tune in to see if there's a whole body yes. I think that can be really effective. Mm. Um, another part of the whole body yes um, that I played with is, it, don't jump to the to the big life decisions as you practice the whole body yes. Um, start small decisions. With, yeah, start with small decisions. That actually makes a really big difference because then you start to um, almost train your body to know what it feels like. So mm. what shoes do you want to wear? What do you want to eat for lunch? <laughs> I started to play with what time I wanted to eat lunch because I was just eating lunch every day at 12 o'clock because I can't. That's how we've been socialized. Yeah. Right, exactly. And I started to check, just do I have a whole body yes to eating right now? And it felt really free first to check in with that and mm. then to follow my whole body yes, because one of the things we say in conscious leadership is the whole body yes is the path to, to genius. So to get to living in your flow state, to get to living in what is your zone of genius, your purpose coming through you, embodying like your gifts, your talent. And having that be connected to your sense of purpose, doing what you do best. Um, if you follow your whole body, yes, it's always going to be a compass that helps you live in your yes. genius. Yes, yes, that is beautiful. That is that that is beautiful because we and, and we haven't illuminated that as much. But thinking about our zone of genius and joy, joy. When we think about that, and you think about our work joy or relationship joy. If we're sitting in our zone of genius, and we'll we'll just couch this in our in, in professional uh, our professional zone of genius, zone of genius. It's what brings us joy. We, we, you know, our skills. I think it's the culmination of our skill sets, our wisdom, our talents, uh, and the context that the whole body yes has has brought us to. Um, I think about again taking all of these coffees and 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 having conversations and people bringing different opportunities to me. Like if there's some level of angst, I'm trying to work through like, mm -hmm. hmm, but if I'm moving toward this, if my body is moving toward this, if my mind is moving toward this, if there's a level of joy, um, I've actually been creating, you know, like writing up a, what a dream position would look like, mm -hmm. I, you know, and I was up till 10 o'clock uh, the other night writing this and I was like, hmm this is moving you closer and closer yes, to where of, you want to say again. It's a, sorry to interrupt you. No worries. I just got excited. Sometimes I interrupt people when I get excited, but <laughs> it's all good. What I was thinking is, uh, it's a kind of manifestation. So, um, I always encourage people to, if they're going to get in the practice of writing, of looking at their most exquisite life or imagining what that could be, make sure you're doing it from above the line. Mm. Because if there's, constriction, resistance, threat, scarcity mindset inside of your most exquisite life, you're not really honoring your highest self. So stopping to pause and say, am I writing this or, or putting this down from a scarcity? Like, am I saying I want a million dollars from below the line or am I saying I want a million dollars from above the line? Um, 
it, those are two very different energies energies to operate from and then to put out into the world and they're going to create different outcomes right so um I don't know if you've heard of an author named Dr. Joe Dispenza, and we could go down a whole rabbit hole about that, but he talks about the science of manifestation. And he basically believes that if you, and he doesn't use the words most exquisite life, but if you imagine the thing that you most want, um, that you start to vibrate at that frequency mm -hmm. and then your yes. energy starts to bring people, opportunities, um, circumstances towards you that are vibrating at that same energy, which I think right. is a really fascinating concept that I practice and totally believe in. Mm. I'm seeing it happen. I'm, I'm truly seeing that happen. The more and more, like I said, I'm getting close to it. And, you know, each time I meet with someone, they're pointing me in, in the next direction. And I keep thinking like, okay, I know where my talent and wisdom are best. I know where my zone of genius is. And for me, and for me to be, to personalize this Joyce and what you've motivated me to do is like, I've got to get out of this scarcity mindset that, you know, it's almost, almost this imposter syndrome, even at this stage of my career, like all of the things that I've done, there's still sometimes this thinking like, Oh, you're still not good enough. Like you've got to work. No. And it, it is a wonderful thing for me to internalize when I hear how the world sees me. Mm -hmm. And it's completely opposite to how I see myself. Yeah. And I've, I've been working through that and, and allowing myself to accept like, okay, there's an incongruency and in what I think about myself and, and the actions and what I do and how people view the work that I've done and mm -hmm. the impact that I've had and actually leaning in that. Cause I think for me is that, um, I, I want to say that I read sometimes that humility and being humble can be detrimental to your, to scaling your life. Um, mm -hmm. It's not being arrogant, but it's also, but it's being confident in that you can move in spaces of your zone of genius and you can be really good because you've taken the time to hone those skills. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, as I move through this, as I manifest this opportunity, I also have to remember like, Hey, you have worked to get to, to this space and the, and yes, the titles and the perceptions of all those things are accurate to who you are and what you've done, except remain humble, mm -hmm. but also think about like sitting in this space and not being from a, a space of constriction, but from a place of abundance. Yeah. And I, and I love this idea of using feedback from the world around you as data points. Uh, to help you see a more complete picture of mm -hmm. your life or the truth, because no one person has the, a full picture of the truth. It's when we are able to weave different points of view together that we start to, to, I guess, I guess like weave those different ways of looking at the world and then have a fuller picture of what's in front of us. I think it's so important to get that feedback. But when I hear you talk about humility, it's not, outsourcing approval, not feeling valuable, worthy, uh, good enough because other people said so, but knowing approval is an inside job. Yes. Yes. Believing that you are whole, perfect and complete, just as you are without needing to be anything, but what you are. And then from that place, looking at the feedback that comes from the world around you to help you test and learn a little bit. Oh, yes. Yes. I love that. One of my good friends and, um, I have a, a personal board of directors that I send my goals out to I love that idea. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I got this from one of my clients, like, you know, these are my, these are my yearly goals. And then I send them a quarterly email, uh, I actually send them to one at the beginning of the quarter to say, this is the quarterly goals that match, you know, that are links to the yearly goals. And then I say at the end of the quarter, this is what happened. And this is how I, how I moved. I got that. Um, my good friend, uh, commander Corey Doolittle, you know, we've talked at length about um, his role uh, as, as a commander. You know, he's one of three people in the world who can do what he does. Um, and that's the interesting thing. But working with him and talking with him and seeing like, hey, I'm one of three people in the world, but I'm also this big black man. And the world has said to me as this big black, big dark skinned black man that some you're, you're not, you know, you're less than. And he's happy, you know, he's internalized that sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, but then he realizes that, Hey, I'm one of the three people in the world that can do what I do. 
Mm-hmm. And as a friend, you know, as a leader, I, you know, I've looked to him for his direction, um, mm-hmm. not only direction professionally, but personally, how he actually is a parent and a husband and all of these different things. And so this affirmations that we see, but it's often right. This internalization of, of, of race and gender, you know, and, and thinking about that, I have a hundred percent responsibility in how I react to the world. Mm-hmm. Right. And it, I also have the responsibility to understand that I might have been triggered, that I'm below the line. But then recognizing, and I think that what we've heard is that I am enough in this world. And I think mm-hmm. Corey says that all the time, this mm-hmm. realization that he said that I am enough, this enoughness, as you just said. And once yeah. you realize this, I think that is the, the biggest part. I am enough. I can grow. I can grow into more enoughness, I think. Yeah. Um but I, I am an, I am enough and I can mm-hmm. manifest this exquisite life if I get out of this scarcity mindset, like in part of yeah. conscious leadership is living in this abundant mindset that I can ma- manifest abundance in my life. Um, yeah, and I can get on a whole, whole term, diatribe. Go ahead. The, ter- the term we like to use it is enoughness. Um, because so again, in my personal experience and then working with clients, so many people overestimate that it's abundance that they need to feel happy and fulfilled, but really it's just enoughness. So if you can operate from a place of, I am enough, then from there, you can start to believe I have enough, Mm. I have all the resources. And as long as I continue to live in my authentic purpose, as long as I continue to operate in my zone of genius. As long as I imagine and go after my most exquisite life, I will always have enough. I, right. I think that was a big game changer for me mm. in trusting to just take the leap and, and move in my whole body. Yes. And reach for that full aliveness. I think another thing that is a, I'm noticing I'm wanting to share is one of the best coaching prompts I ever got was flagging the voice that says, who am I? to do this or that, or yeah. living the most exquisite life. It's so human and natural and normal to have that voice, especially if society has taught you that you're not, you know, you don't look like a man. The or, typical the you, prototype. You know, like as, a, as an Asian woman coming up in a very male, white dominated industry, coming from a culture, I was born in Taiwan that is very patriarchal. Um, you, you know, my mother was arranged into her marriage. She couldn't have imagined what her three daughters in the United States would, and the opportunities that we would have or, or what was available to women in this country. So um, I had a big voice that said, who are you to live in your most exquisite life? Who are you to mm-hmm. um, share this work on consciousness with the world? And a coach that I worked with who I adore named Dave Cashin asked me to ask that question from above the line. He said, you're asking that question from below the line. Who am I to step in my purpose, to, to, to live in my full aliveness? And he said, I want you to ask it from above the line. Who, from curiosity, from right. what we're going to learn, mm. who am I? What will I become? Yes. What is my role in this interconnected yes. web of life? What will happen if I use my voice? Mm, I love that. I love that. The above that, that, that curiosity instead of constriction, like why, why me, you know, why not me? Yeah. Why not me? And that's the realization for me. Why not me? And you should be in these rooms. Why, why don't you think you can't be in these rooms? You know, and, and, and I love that. Thank you so much, Joyce. I mean, it, you know, sometimes, as I say, this show is, is, is a wonderful opportunity for my revolutionaries to hear revolutionary people. It's also an opportunity for me to have conversations about things that I am thinking about that are impacting me. You know, I'm not only the person that does the show, I'm an avid listener. This is my favorite podcast, <laughs> uh, you know, w- with a little bit of hubris. One of the things that struck out, I, I, and I, I want to take us to the, the end of the show is you know, and revolutionaries, make sure that you go out and go to Joyce's LinkedIn page and make sure that you read all nine uh, parts of her blog. One thing that you will realize as, as you go through this is that Joyce is an avid, constant learner. 
like constant learners. He is always reading. George, talk, talk about the, the etiology of that. How did you become a constant learner and what has that done for you? How does that, how has that scaled your life? Because there were so many books and so many links to articles and so many things. I was like, this will take a, this is my year reading list right here. If I, if, if I, you know, uh, move through all nine parts of the blog, but it showed me that constant learning that you have. Talk about that for a second for us. And what has it done for you? Um, I mean, I think I, I'm, I've always been this way. I've always loved books. I've always loved learning um, for as long as I can remember. Um, but when I started to work in advertising, I, I noticed a deep curiosity around the suffering around me. Mm -hmm. Why were all these creative people who had amazing jobs feeling so unhappy? Why was there so much misery inside of this creative industry? Um, and so that's when I started to get really curious about personal development, psychology, and reading every book I could find on leadership to see there was a part of me who was just um, wanting to unpack where this unhappiness was coming from in others and myself and seeing if there's any way to reduce that suffering. Right. Um, and, and I think what it's done for me is just open my mind to all different points of view, to look at research, um, to understand science that I'm not naturally inclined to research myself or be exposed to, um, to, I think one of part of my zone of genius is connecting, distilling ideas and connecting different thoughts, um, to be able to express something that I know to be true. Um, and so just, uh, almost curating different thought, uh, schools of thought and viewpoints has been first really fun. Right. And then uh, has opened and expanded my mind. I mean, when I read Conscious Leadership, I was shook. Um, <laughs> a, a part of me woke up that had been asleep my entire adult life. Um, and that feeling is, I don't know that you can beat it. Right. Um, this process Red pill, of blue pill. expansion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you'll That's never a, be the same, you know? Right. 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 A mind, out, mind outstretched by new ideas will never regain its shape. Um and that's what that that's what I you know I, I learned I read you know I'm a, uh, I read so much uh, I spent a, a lot of time trying to figure out uh, new things to be this constant and that was one of the tenets that we had at Camelback Ventures that was one of our values to be a constant learner and getting outside of your comfort zone of learning to learn new things um, I wasn't a natural I wasn't you know I don't have an MBA from Harvard I wasn't a natural venture capitalist mm -hmm. uh, to learn to understand what a good company is a good a CEO is and you know the due diligence the financial aspects why making investments making bets I was a professor you know I was a professor I started in a, a professor and entrepreneur started my own social venture but to get on the other side, there was a, there was a learning curve. And so I poured myself into it, like mm -hmm. literally reading everything that I could talking to as many people as I could just so I can, and, and it still is a, you know, it still is a part of me. And as, as I manifest this new life of mine, the foundation that I learned at Camelback and, and doing all this, this passion of helping and investing in women and people of color are a part of that journey. But I still read. I want to talk to so many people. And being a constant learner, uh, and hopefully you agree, is a part of conscious leadership. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a part of everyone. When, mm -hmm. And to reference a book, Daniel Pink's book, Drive the Surprising Truth of What Motivates Us, he talks about something. He, he calls it Motivation 3.0. But mm -hmm. it's leaving this world where everyone's primary motivation are these extrinsic motivators, money, title, perks. Um, and stepping into what he, I think he distills it into three things, um, having autonomy. That's really important. Yeah. Um, he calls it the like pursuit of mastery. So this yeah. not being the best at something, but that path and learning to become the best yes. is actually his research shows that makes us feel the most fulfilled. Right. And then the third thing he says is purpose. So everyone's purpose looks different as uh, we all have unique fingerprints, unique DNA, all of our purpose looks a little different. Um, but are we aware of that? Are we doing the work to look inward, to understand our whole body? Yes. Right. We're aligned to our authentic purpose. And if we combine that with learning and some degree of autonomy in our jobs, you know, Daniel Pink talks about that being a recipe for career fulfillment. 
And right. when I was at Meta as a manager or a head of department, I tried to build that into the way the team worked. So looking at what how do, how do we define autonomy for every individual in this department? Because it's subjective um, so that they feel free to do what they do best. How do we make sure that they have a path for learning and we get out of their way, just give them resources, give them opportunities. And then lastly, helping them through hiring coaches or managers who are good at coaching, get in tune with what is their zone of genius? Where is their yes? And what do they think their purpose is at, in that company at that time? Right, right. That is, yeah. And, and thinking about that, you know, thinking about autonomy and what is that, like you said, what does that feel like for folks? Because that, that, is a, that is a part of the drive, freedom. And many people, as we talked about as the outset, why people are leaving, you know, leaving jobs is that they're looking for it. They're looking for autonomy. They're looking for creativity. They're looking to find their zone of genius and whatever it is. Um, we talk about freedom so much. Like, what, is it, what does it mean to be free in, in intellectually, emotionally, and bodily like what does it what does it mean and that because that will lead hopefully to your whole body yes yeah when and when have i have that absolutely when i hear this um notion that people don't want to work anymore i don't actually believe that's true mm -mm. i just think they don't want to work in a cookie cutter way that doesn't yeah. allow for individual differences and preferences so the old model of working whether it's having to come into the office and work from nine to five um that doesn't work for everyone and the world right. is changing. And so people are starting to, to understand that and want that freedom. It's almost like if you think about a painter like Picasso, you wouldn't tell him he's only allowed to paint from <laughs> nine to 12, take a lunch break and then paint from 12 to five or from one to yeah. five. Right. So exactly. I think that's part of maybe what people are picking up on, on, on this great resignation. And then um, people feeling like they've lost touch with their authentic purpose. I think that's what I experienced. So um, are we giving them the tools to, and I, I honestly think this is why coaching can be so valuable. Mm. Are we giving them the tools and resources to investigate their authentic purpose so that they oh, can be connected right. to self? Yeah. I think that's a wonderful thing. And I have to thank my folks at Camelback. They gave me the autonomy and authenticity and allowed me to create something that, you know, was outside of my purview, but I saw the need for it. And they said, Hey, go build this. And that was joy. I loved going to work every day and with my folks. And I just want to give them a shout out. Aaron Walker, Raz, the, the an entire team at Camelback Ventures, a wonderful organization um, built, you know, built around, you know, this process of conscious leadership and how can leaders in the organization fulfill themselves and what they're doing, but also create and organize, create and sustain an organization that is scalable for folks to really succeed, you know, and, and I think about that and want to come to work. You know, usually I, usually Joyce, we don't talk this long on the show. <laughs> usually we're about 45 minutes, but that means that this episode is, you know, and this episode is amazing and, and talking with you and illuminating principles and strategies, uh, you know, for my revolutionaries is just going to be, even more amazing than what we've already done. So I want to thank you. Uh, there were a number of questions that I didn't get to, um, but I just, I just want to thank you for your time and what you're doing and revolutionaries, please, as I said, go check out this blog. It, it is amazing to check out Joyce, uh, check out the conscious leadership group and what they're doing. And, you know, there are a lot of different videos uh, for folks to really get in tune, to really learn about conscious leadership, read the book. It was, it's a wonderful game changer. The 15 commitments to conscious leadership, it changed me and a lot of our founders, a lot of our entrepreneurs at Camelback will say, I was able to transform my life and then move it into my organization. We didn't even get a chance to see how to talk about conscious leadership impacts our relationships. Because I know for me, you know, it has really impacted how I show up in our relationship. Mm -hmm. But Joyce, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Is there anything, any last words you'd like to give us? Yeah. Uh, well, first, thank you so much for having me. I've been listening to the podcast. I'm such a fan. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I had the thought to myself, I wish that I had listened to something like this when I was in my 20s. If I had access mm. to, to this diversity of thought, um, how much better off I would have been. So thank you for Thank you. thinking of me and having me here. And uh, a parting thought that I have is for anybody listening to this who's, who's thinking, okay, I, I want to live 
my most exquisite life. I, I want to be connected to my authentic purpose. What should I do? Um, we talked a lot about 100% responsibility and inside of the 15 commitments of conscious leadership, they outlined three key things to do if you want to step into 100% responsibility. The first is to stop believing the world should show up a certain way mm. and just know that it shows up the way it does. And are you willing to dance and improvise with that? The second is shifting out of a defensive posture and starting to get curious. So can you notice, are you triggered? Are you feeling righteous? Are you in a defensive closed off state? And are you willing to look at what above the line could feel like for you by getting curious, by looking at the opposite of your stories? And then the third is this big question of what if Everything and everyone in our lives, even the greatest adversity, the people we have the most conflict with, the, the biggest hardships. What if it was all here for us? What if life is a custom ordered curriculum for our greatest evolution? Mm, wow. And to, and to live in that space has been able, has given me the power to take responsibility for the life that I most want to create. So when I look back at the life that I've experienced, I wouldn't change any of it because in hindsight, you can see that custom ordered curriculum. And I know that life exposed me to volatility and to violence so that I could um, be someone who values and wants to create peace and harmony. And that life gave me um, a, a experiences of powerlessness so that I could understand what authentic power looks like and seek to leverage it in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. um, that life gave me suffering and um, restriction at times so that I could seek freedom, taste freedom when I had it. And then to be able to step into my role, which, is, which I think is part of my purpose and helping others to feel and experience that freedom as well. Wow. wow. Thank you. That was beautiful. Right. And thinking about that, that the last part in, in itself, I think if we think back to your revolution, it helps us to uns unsubscribe. You know, when we think that there's, you know, we've got a, we've got this custom curriculum. And if we unsubscribe to what we think, you know, the world and really settle in to say, you know, the things that happen allow for me to create the life that I want to have. They're learning. They're the, the the constant learning, as you we've talked about, and looking at that. And we and we said that the the world is not to me; it is by me. We didn't even get a chance to talk about to me, by me, and through me. But understanding that, Joyce, thank you so much for your time and your care and what you're doing for the world. What you've given us today is is the seeding for all of our revolutions, right? And and thinking about how we can show up better in the world, how we can be better revolutionary for ourselves and for the wor world around us. As I say all the time, our revolutions are not for, just for us. And what you're doing in the world is making sure that your revolution, your conscious leadership revolution is something that everyone gets to be a part of. And so I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you so Revolutionaries, much. Revolutionaries, you know that we are here with you and for you. Um, I want to make sure that you're answering what we think is the most thought provoking question of your life. What's a revolution? You know, enjoy yourselves, enjoy your time, enjoy your families. We'll talk to you soon. I love you. I love you. I love you. <laughs>